year is 1985. St. Elmo's fire is at the top of the charts. <laughs> the wreckage of the Titanic has just been discovered at the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean. And on a small farm on the Kansas-Colorado border, a young mother is about to give birth. The local doctor has predicted twins, which gladdens the hearts of the young woman and her husband, who could certainly use the extra help around the farm. But the, the birth, birth does, does not go well. The terrified father drives his screaming, hemorrhaging wife to the local clinic, a poorly funded facility housed in a converted Airstream trailer. The presiding physician is Dr. Charlie Von Cook, a local denture maker with dubious training and eccentric religious beliefs. The labor is long and painful, and Louisa Neville, a Mennonite girl who had given up a promising career as a legal assistant to join her first and only love on the rundown farm that was his inheritance. May her soul rest forever in peace is pronounced dead by the doctor at 11.23 a.m. on the 11th day of September. Precisely 12 minutes after the birth of her twin daughters. The girls are Parapegus, Tripus, Dibrachius twins conjoined at the side, and sharing between them three legs, two arms, three lungs, two hearts, and a single liver. Without hesitating, Dr. Von Cook places the twins on the operating table, muttering biblical quotations of doubtful accuracy. He leaves the trailer and returns with a gas-powered chainsaw. The noise is deafening in the small space as the doctor prepares for the gruesome operation. At that very moment, Sheriff Wilbur Owens, having noticed the Neville's car parked outside, steps in to see if he can be of any assistance. Seeing the crazed doctor hovering above the newborns, the teeth of the chainsaw about to connect with their innocent flesh, the valiant sheriff draws his pistol and fires. As the bullet pierces his heart, Dr. Von Cook emits a cry of pain and stumbles backwards. Samuel Neville, a timid, nervous man who wanted nothing more than a quiet country life with many children, is still in a state of shock over the death of his young wife and the alarming physiology of his daughters when he is struck in the neck by the chainsaw's blade, killing, killing him. him. Instantly. Instantly. Distraught, the good sheriff takes the twins to his car. He radios back to the station, and it is arranged for the twins to be taken to the Bethany Center for Developmentally Disabled Youth in Topeka. The sheriff decides to deliver the twins to the Bethany Center personally. Less than an hour into the drive, an oncoming truck swerves, crosses the median, and strikes the sheriff's car. The sheriff is thrown into the windshield and will die 30 minutes later from loss of blood. <laughs> Meanwhile, the world has become a sea of feathers as the truck's cargo of live chickens, many of them now seriously injured or dead, spill into the road. A small, awkward man limps out of the truck's cab and cautiously approaches the sheriff's vehicle. He cautiously approaches the vehicle, and his eyes fall on the twin girls calmly looking up at him from the back seat. Ignoring the dying sheriff, the truck driver lifts the twins into his arms and places them in the cab of his damaged truck. He unhitches the trailer and climbs into the cab himself, abandoning the defenseless chickens to their grim fate on Interstate 70. A smile forms on his lips as he places the truck into gear and continues down the highway, taking the twin sisters to an uncertain
I have schooled you. Opportunity. You can set it down and leave now. Our volunteers, ladies and gentlemen. For the next six years of their life, the Neville sisters were raised among chickens on a chicken farm in Claxton, Georgia. They lived in a two and a half foot by two and a half foot wire mesh cage and were fed on a steady diet of mashed crumble, pellet, and egg booster. This next tune is a reminiscence of the dark day when their benefactor, the chicken farmer, failed to appear at the noonday feeding. 